solid individual. And so in the school, we're using this if we can, we're going to need experimentation. And, and he represents a lot of the learning that goes on. He has deep expertise in uh, you know, engineering himself. Uh, he's been an advocate of this prayer a lot. This is actually his way of being able to communicate with his spirituality as well as his spirituality. So I think he's on the radio. Yeah, we just, I don't know if you want to try and find him outside, but. presentation but this is the X speed this is a printer that is has the capability to be used in an expeditionary manner it prints via cold spray you can think of that as similar to spray painting with metal so it allows the metal to plastically deform and adhere to a substrate and then that causes a, a rapid buildup of metal um, we've built parts that are uh, maybe two kilograms in about three hours so it has a pretty rapid deposition rate compared to most 3D printing methods um, and uh, allows us to print with metal. This printer can print in stainless steel 316, aluminum 6061, aluminum bronze, and copper. Um, the unit behind me is the speed cell that allows for post-processing to occur. So just behind me are two different furnaces. Um, those can be used for different heat treatments. There's also a CNC machine, which allows us to mill and finish the surfaces of parts that have been printed. Uh, there's a, a drill press, grinder, and a uh, sander as well. All right, so for Salvex, the exercise just before this, we were uh, performing uh, repairs for damages that were caused to the ship uh, in uh, support of the exercise. This is a part that, or one of three parts of an assembly that we had designed. Uh, the other part did not print out appropriately, but this part did print out well. You can see it has a very rough finish compared to any normal uh, method of fabrication, like casting, welding. You're going to have a very rough finish as well. So this is not different than other methods of fabrication in that respect. But once you finish the surface, you can see that it is actually a, a normal bronze. This one is an aluminum bronze that we uh, printed and then uh, post-processed here. Um, Um, I, I can check. I think it was on the realm of about four hours, though. So, it's a very rapid uh, printing process. Um, uh, so, sorry? This one is an aluminum bronze. So, uh, aluminum 6061 mixed with copper. Yes. How much what? How much time have you been So, I, I'm not very well versed on traditional manufacturing methods, but for our supply system, there are parts that take upward of 200 days in order to get by actually going to a contractor saying, uh, or requesting them to make the part and deliver it to us. And then with this, we're able to print in well under a day um, and then post-process within a day. So it's a matter of days rather than hundreds of days. So this can have a substantial impact on our operational readiness. operations to see we, we do like a normal logistics transport to that I don't envision this actually strapped to the top of the ship even though it, it could um, I, I would expect that this would be in a um, forward capacity and then we'd be able to have a, a helicopter or some other method of transport to take this from the shore facility that uh, manufactures it and then deliver to the ship likely Right now we're requesting different 
parts that we can manufacture and deliver. So if you uh, know of any, we would love to make them. Uh, but we've reached out to contacts in the Marine Corps, Coast Guard, Air Force, and, and Navy, uh, and we've started manufacturing those parts. Um, this was for one on a surface ship, but we have parts from uh, submarines and all of the other services I mentioned, mentioned as well. Um, so we are we're designing and creating those. And then develop that into a print capability and network is still developing. But the goals uh, that we have is to provide point of need manufacturing solutions afloat. So that's on the USS Somerset. And the printer you're getting ready to go and see later is going over there on Monday. And so that's to provide the responsiveness at the point of need instead of having the reach back uh, requirements that you would typically have for logistics and avoid those. And then, uh, and then the, the Naval Industrial Base has frankly gotten a lot more brittle over time. And so we're trying to augment that problem. Uh, so there's the industrial base at large, and then there's a tyranny of distance somebody asked me about earlier. So in the Pacific with the pacing plan, there is a tyranny of distance, and so advanced manufacturing at point of need can, can uh, work against the tyranny of distance problem. And, and then we're also employing a network of advanced manufacturing capabilities on Oahu. So we have it at the Air Force Base, the machine shop there. We have one at 25th Infantry Division. Uh, and then assets that we have both afloat and ashore. And then also with Combat Logistics Company 33, the Marine Corps here, and the Marine Air Logistics Squadron here on this base. So a lot of entities involved. Uh, and then we're trying to qualify with local vendors, bare machinery, being the visit that we just hosted today. And they've qualified for electric motors and program offices in the past. And so having somebody local that can help advise on whether our output reaches the specifications that are typically necessary for that part is a big deal and, and Bear is helping us with that. So we've contracted them to help. And then we have our, our uh, mission success criteria, which maybe we can pop that up too. You guys have any questions or anything so far? No questions? Okay. You're just doing a great job. I have a U.S. Navy readiness solution. Did I go from red to green? Meaning, that, did, I, did I go from a problem, uh, what they call a casualty repair requirement, to being uh, mission capable? Uh, same thing for the Marine Corps. Uh, did the metal part, was it 100% complete? So in other words, a lot of times we'll print, we'll get very close. We want 100% completion, so where the part is completely capable in, in, in relation to where the requirements are. And then um, if we can combine parts as a better solution than individual parts, that's another win. So 3D printing, frequently you can do computer-aided design that actually combines the parts instead of having individual requirements. Cold spray repair, the machines you just saw out there, those are cold spray. And so that, that's another, another win if we get that. And then we have numerous criteria in here. Uh, but, but we have a point system to show how big of a success this particular print was. These kinds of things will go in the report that we have at the end of this exercise. The, the Trident Warrior component of Rim of the Pacific exercise is experimentation. And we're experimenting with advanced manufacturing being a readiness solution at the point of need to cut it back on logistics reach back and, and provide fine material composition and validation of what we can make it with. Uh, so we go in and Thanks to some of the companies we're working with, they've given us a tool that we can drop a file in, and it kicks it back out and says, hey, this is the material you can make it, here's your price, here's how long it's going to take, and here's where it's available. We're testing that here and building it as we go. Uh, I'll show you guys, but everything is very messy right now because we're working through the details this week. But overall, the end state is I can take a design for a part that I have and we reverse it, which is huge whenever I'm looking holistic logistic support. Where can I get it? When can I get it? And how fast? That's the question. So this integrates the entire network. So it'll start out with the The part is messing up on the inside. So how we do it is we'll reverse engineer it with a plastic printed part first to make sure that it is the correct size, the correct diameter, form, fit, and function for it, and then we'll move on to the next step, which is the cold spray, which is the machine you just saw outside. So after this step, it's not done yet, it needs to get machined, heat treated, and then it will turn into this piece. 
So after this piece is made, then we should have the exact form, fit, and function we need to repair this piece in the correct, proper way. Same with this, it's, just, it's an antenna mount. Um, the parts that we usually try to do or find are parts that have long lead times that are hard to get, and that will help us uh, chop the supply chain in half to uh, get the parts to the customer as soon as we can. This part right here is a like $15 part. It just goes on top of an antenna, and this probably made it took us 20 minutes to print nine of them, and it probably cost five cents. So really cheap, really fast, but still durable than the OEM part. So, um, and then this is the last print that we have done so far during this operation. It's a parent um, drone camera mount. So this goes on a drone and it holds a camera. This is actually a resin based printer, uh, very durable. As you can see, you can you know, touch it, flex it, a uh, very durable part. So in the end, the goal is just to uh, get the part to the customer uh, with the fastest time we can do, and then um, also the best part we can do. So is that more harder than the other? So uh, this is the, this that, is, you, that, that, this guy. No, 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 oh, no, this no. one, yeah, yeah, you can feel it. So this is a uh, resin printer. Here's the other one. It's a resin printer. It's, it's flexible, but it's durable. So you can still mess around with it, but it's going to still be able to produce you the part that you need. It's, it's crazy, right? Yeah. It's weird. So I can say that it's more harder to print than the other, like the steels or something. Um, actually, it's pretty, it's pretty easy. Yeah. The steels are a little bit more complicated. Um, the resin printers or plastic printers, it just goes into a program called either SOLIDWORKS or MasterCam or any one of those softwares that you have, and then it goes into a slicing software, which tells you how much layer height you want, how much density you want to it, um, those nature things, and then you uh, run a couple test prints and then figure out like, oh, this is the best variation of things that I want, and then you come out with a part that is actually good to put on the, um, the drone in this case. So how long will you take? Uh, this print right here, we yeah. made four different sets of them. So we printed all of these at one time. So all of these part took about 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Is yeah. it possible for us because we use uh, our media train the GoPro is, is any uh, kind of that can within five minutes can let us to film? Oh, to film the print. Yeah. Yeah. This printer is actually in a different location. It's not in this building. Oh, oh my I know. Goodness. I know. <laughs> We've got. Well, the goal was to put printers spread out through the base, so we could. I could go into my system right here, and I could say I want this printed at that printer, and they'll receive it and say start the print. So it's about twenty minutes. Twenty. Second print that we did with it, and as you can see. It's a little bit of a rougher print uh -huh. than the actual resin print. So the material is the same, but the material is a. Um, this is actually a resin print, uh -huh. so it's all like liquefied, mm -hmm. and this is actually the plastic that you'll see coming out of this. Whoa. So they are two different. What, what, what's this raw form? That it, it actually is, sir. It's just a. It's literally a, uh, a, a mayonnaise jar looking like with the can of just filled with metal, liquefied. powdered metal. It's liquefied. Yeah. That's helpful. Got another group coming in. Okay. So this took about 45 minutes to do this part. Yeah. Probably for one. Probably five minutes. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely.
that we made later because this was not going to end up being a useful part since the other portion of the three-part assembly did not print out. So it, those gashes are not something that comes out in the print. It, it came out nicely before and we were post-processing on it and caused those cuts. That was, that was it. <laughs> Uh, this one's not the printer. The printer's on that side. So that's where the actual um, production... Are, are you guys the, the new group? Yeah. Yep. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, so on the left here is the X-Speed. That is a cold spray or a high-pressure cold spray machine created by Speed 3D. Uh, inside, it can create parts that are up to 40 kilograms, so about 88.4 pounds. Uh, and then a cylinder that's a one meter diameter, one meter tall. So it can create large, heavy parts very rapidly. Um, this is unique because uh, a lot of the 3D printers that are out right now either print polymers, so some sort of plastics. Um, this can print in metal. The metals that it can print in are stainless steel 316, aluminum 6061, copper, aluminum bronze, and nickel aluminum bronze. This unit over here is the speed cell. So this is the post-processing unit. And it does extend, there's a CNC machine in the back, so a mill, so it can flatten surfaces and make them fine. Uh, there's a drill press, a grinder, a sander. And then shown right here is the, uh, are the ovens in the back. So this can be used for a thermal process afterward so that we can heat treat metals and then take it from a very hard, very brittle material and turn it into a tougher, uh, holistically stronger material, uh, what you would normally associate with metals. Um, on this side of this machine, um, you can see two separate furnaces. This one is the low temperature furnace. This goes up to only 600 degrees Celsius. The one on your right goes up to 1200 degrees Celsius. Um, if you like a shot of the internal of the, the furnace. So in here, um, we would be able to place a part in using the tongue shown there uh, and then cook it for a specific amount of time that is material dependent. So for stainless steel, uh, the entire heat treatment process is about five hours and then we would quench it after being in the furnace. So that would be taking the hot part and then putting it directly into a bath of water, oil, uh, whatever be used for the specific material. Um, Same as this would be a 5% solid mixture. Um, but inside you can see uh, slits in the, the side of the oven that allows the fan to um, cause a mixture so that there's no thermal stratification within the oven. That way the entire oven is a very even temperature, whatever it's set to. So we have any questions about the uh, post-processing or the ovens? So that part specifically was very heavy and uh, was not terribly convenient to pick up and move. Uh, but you would pinch it up, uh, and I would be wearing thermal, thermally protective gear. So it almost looks like a spacesuit. It's reflective on the outside. That way, the heat, the radiant heat, would be reflected off but you'd pick it up and then place it in the oven. And then there is a, uh, a large tank that we would then take it out of and then mix it inside to uh, make sure that it would be quenched appropriately. That way we would cool it out rapidly and then have a, uh, a very hard finish on the outside of the oven. 
Um, and then the part came out with this rough uh, brownish, uh, kind of rusty look on the outside. Uh, the material is what you would see after the post-processing on this upper lip. Um, so you can see that it is actually a, a good aluminum bronze, um, something that you would see in most uh, traditionally manufactured parts. Uh, just in any process, casting, welding, however you're going to create your part, um, it's going to have a rough wear on the outside until you go through post-processing. So the idea here is that we can get create a net form object and then post-process it to be uh, the final object that we're trying to create. Uh, you mean the, the exterior of that? So this is what the entire part looked like originally. And then we used our CNC, so uh, like a drill press that would be able to cut off material that we don't want. Um, so then that drill came through and finished off the surface here. And then it, sh it exposed the metal underneath. So the entire part is that aluminum bronze. It just isn't as pretty on the outside. But that happens in every single manufacturing method with your casting. Traditional methods will make that same, uh, or a, a similar surface coating that does not look very uh, aesthetic. Because okay. I thought it's, it's going to be outside. Yeah. No, it's no, no. just inside. So this would be welded onto the other part. Uh, the other part did not print off appropriately in the time frame that we had. Uh, so this part ended up not being useful anymore, but this print came out satisfactorily and was exactly what we wanted. Uh, the surface it was going to made into was a slanted surface. So this was slanted just so it would fit in and be able to be welded in appropriately. showed us that it corroded on the inside um, and was damaged, so we needed to create a replacement part for it. So that's when we printed off this one earlier this week. So this is the substrate and then cold spray via plastic deformation would adhere to the substrate and we built it up. I like spray painting with metal. Um, but this was printed off in uh, two hours and fifty-seven minutes. About three hours. Uh, about three hours. So this is like the substrate that you saw the part built on before would be bolted onto this plate. Yeah, yeah. Then the arm would pick up the part and bring it above this nozzle down here. So this bronze looking nozzle uh, is where the um, carrier gas and the metal powders spray out of. Then this arm catches the powders in, a, a, in an appropriate manner to be able to actually print the new parts as they come out. Uh, and then this arm can hold up to 40 kilograms, about 88.4 pounds. Um, and at the one meter diameter, one meter height uh, cylinder that it can print within. Uh, it can also print up to a 45 degree overhang. So I mean, similar to like a, a water tower, it comes up and then uh, while it pops out. Um, <clears throat> and then for stainless steel, at least the powder comes out at uh, 400 or 540 degrees Celsius and 30 bar. So uh, about 500 PSI. Uh, give or take a few. Um, and then this machine is convenient because it actually takes that part after it's being built and then turns it back, right side up to serve it to you. Um, some other machines uh, just swing the arm over, so you need one person to uh, actually hold the part and then someone else to unscrew it. So it's uh, more convenient from that respect as well. So what is the biggest material you made in this machine? Uh, the, so that cooler head that I showed, um, the piece that they wanted us to actually manufacture was larger than the build constraints of the chamber. Mm -hmm. So that's why we uh, built three separate pieces and then we're going to weld them together. Um, so that one was just over 100 pounds, um, but this one can only go up to uh, about uh, 88.4 pounds. So that's why we chopped it up.
。你用这边吗？